In today's video, we're going to review Grandstream's GWN7664, as well as the 7660, and cover Grandstream's approach to multi-access point setup, and see how it stacks up to other solutions. If you want to learn more about these two access points, how they perform, as well as how to set up a multi-access point configuration, then watch the rest of this video. Full disclosure, Grandstream did send me these units to test, but they haven't paid me for this review, nor have they influenced it in any way. The opinions and the results are my own, and they'll see it for the first time just as you're seeing it. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the hardware. If you follow my channel, you know that I've been a Unify user for a long time, and I recently had the opportunity to also test the Ingenious access points along with their SkyKey controller. Both the Ingenious and Unify systems perform really well, but they need a downloadable controller to run on a PC or to purchase a separate controller in order to manage multi-access point configurations in your home or small business. A subscriber suggested I test out Grandstream Network's devices as a possible alternative, with one of the key features being a built-in controller that enables you to configure and manage multi-access point configurations without the need of a separate controller possibly making it a simpler and lower cost alternative. I reached out to them and they immediately sent me two of their newest access points, the GWN7660 and their flagship, the GWN7664, for me to test. Before we get into the configuration, let's quickly cover the hardware and the specs of the GWN7664, which is a direct competitor to the Unify 6 LR and the Ingenious EWS377 access points. To take full advantage of the Wi-Fi 6, this access point is a dual-band 4x4 multi-user MIMO, which runs an embedded controller capable of controlling up to 50 access points. In addition, it's supported by the GWN Manager and the GWN Cloud platforms, and it's capable of handling up to 512 concurrent clients for really high-density applications. It has theoretical coverage of 175 meters, which of course is dependent on your particular environment. Like the Ingenious unit, it has a 2.5 gigabit and a 1 gigabit PoE port. The Unify LR only has a 1 gigabit PoE port, possibly limiting it under really high density, high bandwidth applications. The GWN7660 is a Wi-Fi 6 2x2 multi-user MIMO version, which also offers dual bands and is capable of 256 concurrent clients with the same theoretical range. Like its big brother, it also has a built-in embedded controller capable of controlling up to 50 access points. Any of their access points can be configured as a master controller or a secondary slave. Looking at both units, we can immediately see the huge size difference between the 7664 and the 7660. Looking at the back of the units, we can see that they both use the same mounting approach, a mounting plate that lets you mount onto the wall or ceiling, and once you've got it mounted, you can easily lock the access point into place. This is similar to the approach that Unify uses, and it's far superior to the approach that is used by Ingenious, which I really didn't like. So now that we've seen the hardware, let's talk through the configuration and start by setting up a 7664 as a single access point. In their instructions, they reference several ways that you can connect to the web interface and access the device. You can access the device by using https colon forward slash forward slash gwn underscore and then the MAC address of your device. The second way is to use their discovery tool and the third way is to use the IP address by looking it up on your DHCP of your router. I tried all three ways and had no issues with accessing through the IP address or through the MAC address process. However, their discovery tool didn't work at all for me. I tried several times on both PC and Mac, so I would suggest skipping that process and just use one of the other methods. The MAC address seems to be the most straightforward if you're not sure how to look up your IP address. When you're accessing the interface, you're prompted the first time for a login screen. The username is admin and the password is actually listed on the device, so you just need to type that in. The important thing here is that on your first device, the first time you launch it, you need to make sure that it's set to master in the drop-down menu. 
This is only required on the first device that you'll be using as your controller. If you want your access points to be set up as one system, there can only be one master. Those slave units can be configured as failover. We'll cover more on that later in the video. After you've entered in all the login information, you're presented with the setup wizard, which will walk you through all the basic steps to getting your first SSID going. The next screen is a listing of all your access points. Even though you see both devices listed, we're going to ignore the 7660 for now and focus on setting up just the master. Later in the video, we can see how to add additional access points. So here you just click next. The last screen is where you actually create your default SSID. You can name this what you want, select the security mode and create a shared key. When you're done, click on complete and you're finished. Once you log in, you're presented with an overview page which shows you the number of access points and their status, how many clients, and the channel distribution. Configuration screen currently shows you the access points and their roles and the firmware version. If we select one of the access points and select configure, we can select and change this specific access point information, such as the name, any of the radio settings, and this only applies to this one particular access points, not the group. After you hit save, you'll be prompted to write your changes. This is something you're going to see throughout the interface. Whenever you make changes or multiple changes, they may not get written to at that time, and it'll ask you to apply the changes. Next is the SSID tab. This is where you can create and modify all of your SSIDs. To give you a better idea, let's create a new one. Let's click on add and then type in a new SSID name, select enable, and then select the security mode that you want to use. And finally, just create a shared key. There are other things you can do here, but this is all that's really necessary at this time. You can make this SSID a single band or multi band if you want, and you can assign a VLAN and we'll do this a little bit later on. The next thing we want to do is click on the membership tab at the top. When you, create a, when you create additional SSIDs, you have to remember to assign them to one or more of your access points. Otherwise, they're not going to be available. Either not going to be available at all, or they won't be available in all of the access points that you have spread out. Let's do one more, and this time we'll assign it to one of my VLANs. The process is, is basically the same, except that you select the VLAN box, which opens up another box that you can type in the VLAN ID number that you're using, which for me will be 80, as that's what I'm using for my IoT. Again, make sure you assign that to the device membership and you're ready to go. Next, we have the Clients tab, which currently doesn't have any clients listed as we're just now configuring the device. Going down to the Radio tab, here you can see settings like band steering, channel width selection, channel selection, and radio power. Looking at the settings tab, we can see various system options such as disabling the LEDs, changing the time zone, NTP servers, and the date format. If we click on the account tab, here we can change the admin password as well as set a new user password. If we jump down to the firmware section, this is where I actually encountered my second issue. Out of the box, the default firmware server doesn't seem to work and continuously gives you an error message. I spent some time trying to fix this, assuming it was on my end, and finally resorted to searching the internet to see if others were experiencing the same thing that I was seeing. I was able to find a post that mentioned the firmware server was actually incorrect and needed to be changed to firmware.grandstream.com. Once I made the change, everything started working and installed updates as it was supposed to. I'm not sure why they have that as a default, but at least for me, it certainly didn't work. In terms of configuring the sing a single access point, that's pretty much all you need to do. There's obviously a whole bunch more settings you can play with, but this is all you really need to get up and running with one or more SSIDs. So before we get into testing, I want to show you how easy it is to set up any additional access points with one minor caveat. Assuming you've powered up the second access point, going back to the configuration page, click on Discover AP, and you should be greeted with a list of unpaired access points. If you click on the link icon to the right under Actions, this will pair your access point and add it to your current system. Once you do that, you'll see the device being provisioned. There is a small catch, however. 
because I configured the master access point and did update the firmware to the latest version on the master device. When I tried to add the second access point, it would not pair due to being an older firmware version. To address this, I had to set up the GWN7660, which is the one I'm using for a second unit, as a master unit, update the firmware, then do a factory reset. From that point on, it was painless and it joined the system as it should. So this isn't really difficult to do. If you don't know that you need to do that, it's a little bit frustrating. This is something that could easily be addressed in future firmware. This is just what I ran through. Also, if you set up all your access points at once, that shouldn't be an issue. Back on the configuration screen, we now see both access points listed, the master and any others that you've joined. Again, you can selectively make certain changes to any of those access points, such as the name, specific radio changes that you might want. One of the very cool features that I hadn't seen before is that you can actually designate one of the slave units as a failover master. In the event that the master goes offline, the failover will take over at managing the systems. To set this up, just click on failover and select the access point you want to designate as a failover device. Going back to the status page, we can see that the secondary AP has a failover symbol indicating that it's a failover device. Last thing you want to do is to make sure that your new access points are added to your SSIDs by clicking on the SSID and clicking on device membership for each of the SSIDs that you've set up. If they're not added, just simply click and add the ones that you want. What I found is if you configured all your SSIDs on your master device and then added the slave units afterwards, all of the standard SSIDs, in other words, non-VLAN IDs, get added automatically. But anything with a VLAN, you'll have to add manually. Again, not a big deal. You just have to know it's there and check it out. Okay, now that we have everything working, let's do some quick testing and see how this thing performs. As I have a one gig download speed on my internet, I use the speed test app for my initial test. The Unify has many devices attached to it, uh, spanning four SSIDs, three of which are VLANs. But in my experience, this only has a small impact in performance, as many of these devices are really low bandwidth. As you can see, the Grandstream devices perform exceptionally well in this test, actually making them one of the fastest units to date using speed test. Next, I tested the devices using iPerf. As this is a very different type of test, the results were a little bit different, and both the Unify and Grandstream were very close to one another in terms of performance. I repeated these tests numerous times and got pretty much the same results every time. Once you get into this level of device, I found that they all perform pretty well, and this was no exception. The speed test results are one of the fastest I've seen to date, and the iPerf readings were on par with the Unify 6 LR. What truly sets these apart are features, ease of use, flexibility, and price. And when I compare the Grandstream devices to other competitors such as Ubiquity or Ingenious, Grandstream does have the edge on the overall value. One of the key reasons for this is the inclusion of a multi-device controller that's actually built into the access point. This may sound like a small thing, but if you've worked with multiple access points in the past, you know how important having a controller is. And not having to buy one or download something to run on a PC is a huge benefit. So in summary, would I recommend Grandstream devices? And after spending some time with them, I absolutely would. The controller is much better than anything Ingenious has to offer, not to mention much better mounting system that's more on par with the Unify devices. Though I did run into a few initial bugs when setting this up, the overall experience was really good, and again, it was much better than the Ingenious devices. When comparing this to the Unify products, I would say they're comparable, with each having their own strengths. I still believe the Unify controller is a little bit more user-friendly, but it does require a separate unit or controller software. In terms of overall value, the Grandstream has the edge because of the integrated controller flexibility and performance. When you add all these devices, including the controller together, the Grandstream is a great choice for overall value and performance. I want to thank the team at Grandstream for sending me these units to test. It's pretty obvious they're confident in their product, and they should be. If you found today's video useful, please give it a like and hit that subscribe button. And set the notifications so you'll be notified when there's new content available. 
Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.